I'm sorry, not JRE, JDK. Did anyone have problems with that? How many of you, at least on our lab machine or on one of your machines, compiled and ran the Hello World application? All right. If you haven't done that, that's something I would suggest you do, like, right away, just to make sure you have that. Because you want to have that down before we go and, and try to do anything more. All right? Um, <clears throat> If you want to have it on uh, a machine other than a lab machine, make sure you get it installed on one of your machines, whether it be a laptop or a desktop. Um, let's take a brief look at the Hello World, and then we'll build from there and go on to the next couple of things. This should largely be review of what we did, but I want to make sure that certain points are really emphasized before we go on. All right, here is the code for it. Thank you. I'm going to create it in a simple text editor, so I'm going to use Notepad++. First of all, um, convention for class names, the first word of every word, the first letter of every word should be capitalized. Um, Hello, so hello world will be hello world with the H and W capitalized. Um, that's useful because at a glance you can tell what are classes. All right. So for example, string is capitalized. Ooh, guess what? That means string is a class. System is capitalized. Um, that means that system is a class. Out and print LN are not capitalized. Neither is public, static, void, or main, or args. That tells you that those must be something else. Those are not classes. So to my knowledge, um, by convention, the only thing that are capitalized are class names. Um, treat Java, even if you're doing it on Windows, as being completely case sensitive. So when I say that the, the file should be named the class name dot Java, the case should match as well. So I'm going to go and I'm going to save this file as the class name dot Java. One second. And I'm going to make sure I match the case. Yes? Well, well, that's a good question. What if you have multiple classes? If you have multiple classes, you're going to have multiple files. So uh, we'll probably get an example of that today. But for example, if you had a, um, a, 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 a class that's sort of the boss class and a class that did employee calculations, for example, you would, um, you would call the one boss.java and the other one employee.java. So each class should have its own file. There are some exceptions to that, but to start out, that's how we'll do in all cases. We'll talk about the exceptions later on in the term. All right? So I'm going to save this under the name of Hello World. Dot Java. Again, given this Notepad++ is expecting certain file types, so if you just select uh, the file type of Java, that should be enough. If you are using Notepad, 
you might have to change it from text file to all files and then type in the .java. So this will save it, and I'm going to save it on the desktop. It doesn't have to be on the desktop. Um, in fact, I would suggest, you know, as you go forward, create a folder for it and save it in the folder. So let's do that right now. I'm going to create a new folder, and I'll call it example. then that will be useful for another reason as well. When I go to save this, I'll go and say, save as a Java file, Java source file, and I'll put it in my example folder. And I'll call it Hello World Java using the same capitalizing conventions. All right. So there we go. All right. Remember that everything, all your code is going to be in a class or one class or another. All right. So everything is going to exist in a class. In your application, you will have at least one class uh, that contains a method named main. And that method will look like this. The first part of the method will look like this. Public static void main string bracket bracket args parenthesis and then you'll have the contents of your main function there. All right. This, by the way, is sometimes called the signature of the function. All right. The signature of the function being the scope of the function, whether it's public or not, um, whether it's a static function or not or method, what it returns, the name of the function, and any arguments that it takes. All right, so you'll have at least one class that has this. You can consider this to be sort of the boss class, or the driver class, or we're going to call it our unit test class. We'll talk a little bit more about that later on. All right, so this is a class that sort of brings everything together, and this is a class that you're going to run all right, and then it will call other classes as needed. All right. Remember, this and this are comments. This is a command that simply says output to whatever the standard output is, which by default is um, the, the screen. Um, put a line break after it. Output the phrase, hello world. So how do we run this? Well, first of all, we get to a command line. What did I do? To make the font bigger. Now, we are in users BU. All right? We have to get to the folder that we want to get to. I made that folder on the desktop. Um, so, CD desktop will take me down to the folder desktop. The folder is called example, and I can type in CD example to get to that folder. And I'm there. You know you're in the right folder if you do a dir command, which is directory, and you see your Java source file. All right. So really, all you need to know to get around in this class is the cd command, and the dir command, and then the commands associated with Java. Java compile and Java run. So you don't have to be an expert in command line to do, to do this. Everything else you can do through Windows, like I could have made my folder through the command line, but I didn't. I did that through the GUI. All right. But to get to the command line and compile, this is all you, you do. CLS is also useful because that clears the screen from any garbage that's there before. All right. Now, we compile this code by typing in Java C and by type, and typing the name of the class that we want to compile. 
to be more specific, we type in the name of the class source file. Remember in Java, you have a source file that ends in dot .java. That is human readable. It's a Java code that you've written. It's readable. It's understandable by people. But that's not what the Java virtual machine runs. There's a procedure by which you compile, create a class file, a .class file, and that is what the virtual machine runs. And there's a translation that's involved, and the class file is not human readable. It's what the Java virtual machine needs. All right. Remember that in Java, your code is not compiled to native machine language code. All right. It is compiled to this, what is called byte code. And that byte code gets executed by the Java virtual machine. Um, that allows cross-platform compatibility. Because as long as you have the Java compiler and a Java virtual machine for a particular platform, you can run Java on it. All right. So I'm going to execute this. It does its chugging. And it comes back with nothing if there's no errors. All right. It doesn't even congratulate you. Um, I get congratulated when I upload my videos to YouTube. I get a little email. Congratulations, you've uploaded a video to YouTube. It's like a nice little reminder. It's like, hey, I did something right today. Right? But it doesn't congratulate you. Uh, but this is a case of no news is good news. And that means that there's no errors and you're prepared to run it. If I type in a DIR now, you'll notice I see two files. I see the hello world.java file and the hello world.class file. And then what I can do is run it by typing in Java and then the name of the class. But I don't need to type in the extension. So I can just say Java hello world. And it will run it and it tells me that. All right. Yay. Good to go. Any questions about this? What are the common things that people get wrong? Case sensitivity. If you're not careful, you could do something like this. All right. In which case, doesn't know what system is. Doesn't know what system with the lower case is. All right, therefore it gives you an error. So anything case sensitive is a potential error. Um, forgetting your semicolon at the end of the line is a big cause of errors. And it's funny. It tells you, hey, you forgot a semicolon. Does it put in one in for you? No. Nope. But you know what? You don't want it to. You don't want your compiler to make assumptions about what you want to do. If you did something wrong, that's on you. Correct it. Maybe there was supposed to be more on in that instruction or whatever. Another common thing is to get the brackets messed up. Either have too many or too few. I'm going to put an extra bracket there. Actually, those are probably called braces rather than brackets. But And it'll tell me, hey, doesn't tell me that there's too many braces. It tells me it expects something else. And this is where experience will sort of get used to, you'll get used to the verbiage of these error messages. But remember, this is a computer that is trying to translate your program. So it's not like thinking in human terms. What this is saying is, Essentially, it reached the end of the class, and there was more stuff. And therefore, that's a problem. All right? The end of the class is what? The end of the class is this, right here. Because that lines up with that. So it doesn't know what to do with that extra brace at the bottom. And it thinks that you probably want something else instead of that brace. So it tells you, hey, um, I reached the end of the class, and I didn't get anything that I expected. It doesn't tell you that it got a bracket. Well, I guess it kind of does tell you it got a bracket. 
by displaying that. But it's expecting something else. The reverse side is might be a little more uh, user friendly. Reach the end of the file while parsing. All right. You kind of, well, I guess that isn't necessarily intuitive. You have to read between the lines. If it complains it reached the end of the file, it means that it hit the end of the file and it was still expecting something else. Well, what is it expecting? It's expecting another brace to finish this out. So if it tells you it hit the end of the file, it means that it's still looking for something. And a lot of times that's going to be a brace. A big advantage of using Notepad++ instead of Notepad is the fact that you can verify that the braces line up just visually by looking at the, at the colors. You can also expand or contract these little nodes to see and make sure you have the right number of braces. So that is useful. So I use an IDE, but I will concede to allowing you to use Notepad++ to get that nice little color coding feature. This is also where your indenting really comes in good. Because if you can imagine, you know, this is a, this is like the tiniest class, you could, tiniest Java thing that you could get. You know, you're going to have um, classes that have multiple functions in them. Each function is going to be long and each function might have loops and if statements and all of those have braces associated with them. So if everything is sort of pushed over to the left, it becomes real hard to match up the braces. Whereas if you use the indenting convention, if, for example, I had a loop here and I did something, I would indent the lines in the loop. And if I had an if statement in there, I would indent the stuff in the if statement. Looking to see if it had something. I don't see it. I'm not sure if Notepad++ has it. I do work with a, uh, a tool that does Java-based programming that has a code cleanup that will like automatically like redo the indents to make it all neat. And that's a nice feature. I don't know if this has. I don't see it in this case. So it probably doesn't. All right. That's about all I can think of to talk to, talk about in this application. All right, not bad. Five lines of code, and I talked about it for probably a half hour or so, a few minutes, you know, last time and this time. So we're going to go to a little, little more advanced. Not terribly advanced, but a little bit more advanced. And this is similar to what you need to do for your assignment. Let's look at your assignment. Your assignment is to essentially do like a Mad Lib. What's a Mad Lib? A Mad Lib is where you have a poem or, or a song or something, and you substitute random words for keywords in it. Like, Mary had a little lamb, you know. You could put a space to randomly select a name. So you could have Mary, John, and Joe. Instead of lamb, you could have lamb, rabbit, cat. Instead of fleece, you could say fleece, fur, um, feathers. All right, and then you could randomly select from that to, to say, you know, Joe had a little cat, its feathers were white as snow, or something like that. So, what you need to do for this is you need to be able to output stuff. Well, we saw how to do that with the, with the system.outprintln. So we can output the hard-coded part of the poem. But what we need to be able to do is output a variable that's randomly selected. So let's take a look and see how to do that. I have part of this, and you can supply the rest. Now again, the idea of this is really just to make sure that you have the basics of Java, that you can, you can go in, you can enter the code, you can run it, compile it, get your results. So I'm going to download this class.
This is adapted off of the same old Hello World class. I am going to put it in my example folder. I'm going to get rid of the old Hello World class. And I'm going to pop that in there. And I'm going to rename it back to Hello World. And now I'm going to go in and compile it and run it. So again, how to do it, CD desktop. One command that's also useful is PWD, uh, but it's useful in, in Unix, not in, in DOS. <laughs> I think it's just CD, yeah. In Windows, it's CD. CD simply tells you what directory you're in. Now, you usually know that because your prompt is set to the directory name, but in some cases, that can get messed up, and so CD with no directory after it is a good, uh, useful command. So DIR, again, gives me a list. Um, of course, you can get fancy, DIR-D. -D. I thought it gave me directories. Oh, well. All right, and now I'm in the directories folder. So I can compile hello world.java. No news is good news. And I can run it. it says hello Mike. I run it again. Hello Joyce. Run it again. Hello Jerry and so on down the line. So it's randomly selecting from a list of names, which is something that you'll need to do, except, hint, hint, you'll need to do it a couple times, right? Because you're going to do a Mad Lib. Your Mad Lib should have more than just one thing in it. Come on, you know. Um, so let's take a look at this and make sure that we understand it. By the way, if you don't call it by the same name, it will give you a warning, I believe, if, if I were to call my file something else. All right, let's edit this. It's almost the same, except I have an array of names. I have a random number generator, and my system out print LN is a little different. So let's look at this one at a time. This is declaring an array. Can anyone define what an array is? Yes? It's a collection of items under a common Yeah, so it's a, it's a collection of items, or you could call it a list of items, a group of items, a set of items, whatever you want to call it. Um, and unlike regular variables, an array can hold several things, whereas a plain old variable can only hold one thing. If I have an integer, if I declare an integer, that integer could only have one value at a time. If I declare an array of names, that array can contain a list of names. So, string, no string is uppercase. That tells you that the string thing, all right, I didn't want to go for the obvious rhyme there, but the string thing, whatever a string is, is a class, all right? Almost everything in Java is a class. There are a few exceptions, and we'll see an exception in the very next line, all right? So, String says that this is going to contain strings. Well, what do I mean by strings? I mean any collection of characters, like names, mix of names and, and, and symbols, or mix of letters and symbols and numbers. All those things are strings. So names are definitely strings. This is saying I have a string array. That's what the two 
brackets mean after it is that it's an array. The name of the array is names, so that's the name of the list. And the list consists of, again, here's another use of brackets to define an array, consists of four names. Mike, Joe, Jerry, and Joyce. Okay? You number those things starting with zero. So I can simply say, what's the value of names? Names has four values, has a list of four values. When I refer to a particular name, I have to give the, the, the what's called the subscript, or the index of it. And numbering those starts with zero. So Mike would be name sub zero, Joe would be name sub one, Jerry would be name sub two, and Joyce would be name sub three. Okay, so it's an array, it's a list, each element of the list gets a number, and the numbers start with zero. All right? So if I want a particular name, that hurt. I don't know what I did. I just like push my elbow down, and it like it struck a nerve. Oh my God. <laughs> I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Thank you for your concern. Uh, so each name on the list has a number associated with it. So if I want to choose a name, I say, give me something from this list, this number of the person. I would assume you already know this from CISS 160, and this is review, but it doesn't hurt. You know, who knows when you last had that, right? OK, so that's what this does. This makes a list of strings called names, and there's four names in it. The names are separated by commas. They're enclosed in the, in the braces. All right. Next thing is int random. All right. Right off the bat, you notice int is not capitalized. So therefore, it is not what? It's not a class. Int, along with a handful of other things, Boolean, double, there's a few other things, are what are called primitives. All right? Right now, just make that distinction. There's a giant difference between how class things and how primitive things are stored in memory. And it's not just like, how do I want to say it? It's not just like a technical detail that's amusing to know like if you're ever on Jeopardy or something, it really has a big impact, the way that it's actually stored in the computer's memory. It's different for primitives than for class things. All right? And therefore, uh, we're going to explore this in a lot more detail. For now, uh, an int is like a simple data value, an integer. What's an integer do? It's just a number. Right? Nothing terribly complex about that. So I say int, and the name of my integer is random, equals this complicated expression. All right? This is a random number generator. This will generate a number between 0 and 3, All right? which coincidentally, or actually not coincidentally, corresponds to the numbers of the names in the array, 0, 1, 2, and 3. So I'm essentially rolling a four-sided dice. Is that possible? I guess. I don't know. Four-sided dice that has a value 0, 1, 2, and 3. And I'm seeing what value it gets. Let's make sure we understand it. This number, this math.random, will give me a value between 0 and 0.99999. So let's, let's work from the inside the parentheses out. Math.random is a function. The tip off that is a function is there's parentheses after it. Math is a class. This is what's known as a static function. We talked a little bit about static functions. All right. 
This will give me a number between 0 and 0.99999 repeating. So almost up to 1, but not quite up to 1. And it'll give it to me randomly distributed throughout there. So, you know, if I did this 100 times, I should have pretty close to 25 zeros, 25 ones, 25 twos, and 25 threes. Not exactly, right? Because you could flip a coin 100 times, and you probably won't have 50 heads and 50 tails. You might have 51 and 49, or 53 and 47, or whatever, all right? But this should randomly give me a number between 0 and 0 0.99, all right? I multiply that by 4. That's what the times 4 says. So how big is this going to be? Well, 4 times 0 is 0. So lowest value is still 0. 4 times 0 0.99999, is that going to be 4? It will give me almost 4, but not quite. Right? Because 4 times 1 would be 4. Right? But this never makes it all the way up to 1. This makes it to 4.99999. Therefore, we're going to get a value between 0 and something like 3.99999. All right? And again, it's going to be randomly distributed. All right? So we're not going to get, you know, it's not going to be loaded one way or another. If we ran this enough times, we'd get approximately the same number each time. Same, same number of each number each time. All right. So that is that part. So this part right here gives me a number from 0 to 3.9999999. That's the highest it will be. Not quite 4, just a notch below 4. Int does 1. It converts it to an integer. And um, another word for this, sometimes it's used in Java, is it will cast it as an integer. Cast convert are roughly the same thing. And it does so by truncating. All right? So the int part says convert this whole thing to an integer. So 0 converted to an integer is 0. 3.99999 converted to an integer is 3. We're just going to truncate all that. And so we can get 0, 1, 2, or 3. So for example, if we did our random number and we got 0.3 as our random number, if this returned 0.3, that would be 0.3 times 4. That would be 1.2. We convert 1.2 to an integer, and we get 1. If we got a, 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 seven, a 0.7 in the random number, 4 times 0.7 is 2.8. We multiply it by, um, oh, we already multiply by 4, so we have 2.8. We truncate it, and we have a value of 2. So the bottom line is when we're done, we should have an evenly distributed random choice of 0, 1, 2, or 3, which, again, corresponds to the numbers of the things in the list. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Now, I hard coded that number four. There's actually a better way to do that, and we'll do that in a second. We'll show you how to do that in a second. I just put a four in there. I, I went one, two, three, four. All right. There's actually a cooler way to do it than that. Um. System.outprint line, hello. Okay, that part's the same of the hello world. I have a plus, and a plus when you're dealing with things that aren't numbers means concatenation. So I'm going to put these two strings next to each other. Names, 
sub-random. And remember, random is going to contain a number 0 to 4. I'm sorry, 0 to 3. We're going to use that 0 to 3 to go in and say, boom, you know, if it was a 2, 0, 1, 2. If it was a 1, 0, 1. If it was a 0, 0, and so on down the line. All right. Questions? Now, one of the things that I'm going to preach in this class is maintainability, right? Because writing code that works isn't the be-all, end-all. That's only part of the job. If your code works, that's good, right? It's better not working, right? But it doesn't mean you have a good program just because it works. A good program is a program that works and, in addition to some other things, is easy to go and change. So let's go and add another name to the list. Let's add Bill to the list. And let's compile it. Hello, Joe. Hello, Joyce. Hello, Mike. Whoops. What are you noticing here? We're not getting Bill there. Why not? Exactly. Because we're, we're still generating a number between 0 and 4. All right? Um, and yet, now there's five names, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. And we're generating a number between 0 and 3. I might have said 0 and 4 before. I meant 0 and 3. So therefore, we're never going to roll a 4 on our dice. So Bill will never get picked. All right? That's one problem. That's why thoroughly testing your code has worked, is good. If I have, this is my assignment, let's say, and I had this code, and I went and ran this, I might be fooled into thinking that it worked because it generated a random name, generated another random name. But you would need to take steps to make sure that it really is generating the full range of possibilities. All right? Now, here's something that's even worse. What if I get rid of a couple of names? Hello, Jerry. Worked. Hello, Mike. Worked. Hello, Joe. Worked. Hello, Joe. It worked. Hello, Joe. It worked. Boom. I get a big old ugly air. All right. Now, notice, did I get that ugly air the first time? No. It looked like it worked. So another thing I'm going to stress in this class is adequate testing. You don't simply test something once and say, yeah, looks like it worked. Gave me the right answer. And we'll talk more about testing as these things get more complex. All right? But we ran a bunch of tests. To, you know, a bunch of tests are necessary if you have a random element in here. So the problem is, as you probably identified, that this number has to match up with the actual number of things here. So if I go and add a name to the array, or two names to the array, or whatever, I have to change it in two places. Well, let's imagine this is an actual program. And let's even imagine it's a more complicated program than this. All right? If I add a name to the list, I have to change that number from a 4 to a 5 to whatever the value is. Every name to the list I add, I have to change two things. What's eventually going to happen? We're going to change one and not the other, all right? Over a long period of time, especially if this is more complicated, we're going to run into the issue where 
we get those two things out of sync. And that's how bugs are introduced. A better way would be that if we wanted to add a name, all we would have to do is add a name to the list, and this number would automatically change to reflect the current numbers. How can we do that? Well, let's do a Google. And I'm just typing in Java array how many? How do you count the elements of an array in Java? Whoa, first answer. Say I have the array, blah, 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 blah. Isn't quite what I expected. All right. Well, it is. The size, oh no, that's an array list. That length, okay, thank you. So, if I change this to say names dot length, then if I add a name to the list, it will adjust this number to match the length of it. Now it compiled, and if I run it, hello Mike, hello Bill, hello Joe, and I can run it a whole bunch of times, and it should never blow up, and it should give me each person an appropriate number of times. So again, ideally, the less you have to change to make something work, the better the code is. Ideally, every change you should only need to make in one place. So what am I talking about every change? Well, what if uh, the sales tax rate changes in Loring County? Ideally, there should be one place you have to change that. And this is true as far as programming design, software design, web design, database design. All these principles are the same. You know, you don't want to have to change things in multiple places because you know at some point it's going to get out of sync. All right, and therefore, um, you know, you're going to you're going to be running into a problem. All right, so if you can make the change in one place, that's a win for everyone. All right. Debating, we have five minutes left. I'm debating whether I want to continue or finish off and pick up on this next time. Are there any questions on this, first of all? All right, yeah, go ahead. Static. A static class, and we'll, def we'll, we'll later on in the course we'll, we'll talk about after we've talked about classes versus objects, but a static, cla uh, static uh, method is one that gets called on the class, not on the object. Um, that's sort of our next topic is to talk about classes and objects. What is the difference between a class and an object? I mean, some of you may have done some programming before. What's a class versus an object? Yes? What was the first part of that? Oh, not really. Yes? A text box would be an example of an object, all right, but, but in more general terms. A class is a code that describes a bunch of similar things, all right? And it contains data, and it contains functions that relate to a whole bunch of different things, all right? 
I could make, for example, a student class, right? There's a whole bunch of students in the, in the world, or there's a whole bunch of students at this college, right? I could make in code a student class. A student class would contain everything that the system needs to know about a student. So it would have things like the student's name, the student's number, address, email address, um, and so on and so forth. It would also have functions that you'd do. Like, what is the student's GPA? There'd be a formula to calculate the student's GPA. Um, what is, how many credit hours does the student have? What's the student's tuition bill for um, the, this semester? All those sorts of things would be functions to calculate them. So the class represents an entire group of things that we're going to write software for. An object is one of those things that we're looking at at a time. So in a class, we declare all the things that we want to know about a student and all the functions, all the calculations that can be performed for a student. In our code, though, we're going to look at one student at a time. If you imagine we're going to produce, you know, back in the old days when they produced report cards, let's say. You know, there's a method to produce a report card. Well, we would first pull up the first student object. An object would point to one student, all right? And we would print their report card with their information on it. Pull, get the next student, pull up their report card with their information, and so on and so forth. So a object represents one member of the group that the class pertains to. So student would be the class, you would be an object, or the software that represents you in the system would be an object. Um, computers would be a class, this computer sitting right here on my desk would be an object. So next time what we'll do is we'll start writing code that uses multiple classes and uses objects. And we'll spend a lot of time discussing the difference between objects and classes to make sure you really have a good understanding of it. This example is posted to Canvas if you want to download it. All right. And we'll see you uh, up in lab.